Okay. Hello and welcome to our weekly Wednesday night live stream. I am your host, Dana Morningstar, and this is a live stream that we do pretty much every Wednesday night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So if you are new here, welcome. And if you are returning here, welcome. So before I forget, I just wanted to mention book club is tomorrow night, Thursday. It's always the last Thursday of the month at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So the book we're going to be discussing, and my book is not up here. The book we're going to be discussing is Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. So it's a fantastic book, and it's chock full of information. So I hope you guys can make it. Um, Agatha is here. Hello, my dear. Book club is tomorrow. FYI. <laughs> don't, don't forget. Don't forget. Uh, I'll send a message out to you and James and Shay tomorrow. So uh, Mariposa, Alyssa, Paul. Hello. Hello. Yes, I know. Agatha says, send me your notes. I know. I need to. I am still working on them. So I thought I'd have them done yesterday, and then I just, I didn't get around to it. But I'm almost done. I'm on, I think, like, point number four, and I try to do it seven points or so per book. So I, I'm getting there. I'll send them to you tomorrow. Oh, lots of people just came on. Kamami, Bonsoir, David, James, Phoenix. Grace Frankendahl, hello, hello, everyone. And also, and, and, um, I received a question the other day. Actually, you know what? I received a question that I wanted to address, but I also came across a great comment. Let me see if I can figure out how to use my phone and get my screenshots. I swear, I don't know why it's taking me this long to figure out this phone. It's so frustrating. Um, excuse me. Let's see. Albums, screenshots. Okay. Let me read this comment first because it's so good. And then we'll get into the question because it's going to be longer. Okay. So the comment is from Charlotte who says, uh, talking about narcissists and saying, um, okay, so rattlesnake poison goes directly to and attacks the central nervous system, incapacitating its victims. That's what it's for, and that's all it does. Once bitten and injected, the snake just sits back and wait for and waits for it to take effect. It allows him to be a snake, to live as a snake, and to make more snakes. The malignant narcissist tools are just as specific and effective. It becomes such routine and commonplace with the malignant narcissist meets an educated empath and injects his, po his or her poison that they will have a look of total astonishment, bewilderment, and are stunned that it didn't work on them at all. Much like when a scantily clad woman can't get a reaction from an unknown to her homosexual man, she is dumbfounded that it doesn't work and that her charms have no effect. I thought that was so well said because that's exactly what it is. If anybody has experienced um, trying somebody who's actively trying to manipulate you and just, you know, all of, all of the manipulations and it doesn't work. Uh, Agatha, I know you can relate to this, um, how they don't know, they don't know what to do with it and they'll start changing around their game and they'll just start amping it up with an attempt to get you to cave because then at that point, they take it as a complete, like they really internalize that and they freak out thinking like, what's wrong with me? Now there's something even more wrong with me because I should be able to manipulate this person and I can't. Um, so especially, especially if they know that the person they're trying to manipulate has a history of abuse or just got out of a bad relationship or whatnot, because they know that we are especially vulnerable to their charms. So to not fall for it is a, is a huge uh, victory for us and a huge devastating loss for them. But I like the analogy of, it's like a scantily clad woman 
who's trying to seduce the guy and he's just not interested in her at all. And she doesn't realize, oh, it's, <laughs> he's gay. That's why he's not interested in you. Yep, Agatha, that's exactly who I was thinking about when I read that comment was that guy, that one guy. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so yes, the question that I was going to address, uh, I don't know if he wants me to say his name, so I'm not going to say names, but the question is in regards to feeling insecure when you're trying to go out and date after narcissistic abuse. And there's a lot of different ways that people can feel insecure after these relationships and trying to enter into their next relationship. And of course, it depends on kind of what they went through as well, but it might be um, feeling insecure about things that their narcissistic or abusive partner was targeting them about. So which can be any, I mean, anything, looks, sexual performance, uh, I don't know, um, age, weight, height, I mean, you name it. So that's common for that kind of stuff to carry, to stay with the person for quite a while. Um, if that wasn't present, if there was no like belittling or demeaning or devaluing to that level, a person can also still feel insecure of feeling like they just don't have that much to offer the next person, like feeling like damaged goods or um, just kind of feeling profoundly broken in a lot of different ways, which it just can be a very isolating feeling. So, so the question was, okay, so if you're feeling really insecure, what then what can you do about it? And Tony Robbins is a big fan of sort of like, if you want to change the belief that you have, he refers to it as get it, then you need to get new references. So you need to get new reasons to support this new belief that you have. I'm such a huge fan of that. So uh, if, you know, there were things that you were devalued about and you're like, okay, you know what? Yeah, there's, uh, in this person's situation, he was saying, he's like, you know what? Like, I'm a good looking guy. I'm in shape. I make good money. I have, you know, um, these are the things that I have going for me and I don't, um, but I, he was still feeling really, really insecure around women. And so I think it can help to start writing out a list of, I guess I would specify like, what is it as clearly as you can that's causing this insecurity? Like, is it a certain thing? Is it your appearance? Is it, um, you know, just dating in general? Is it, uh, you know, just the dynamic of having a relationship with a woman again? what getting as specific as you possibly can about where um, that insecurity is coming from, I think would be part number one. And then part number two is to start looking for different supporting references in your life to prove, to prove all of that toxic talk wrong. So if you're telling yourself, Oh, I just don't have, um, I don't know if I'd make a good partner, for example, then then getting clear with yourself on all the different ways that you would make a good partner. Maybe you're a good listener. Maybe you're a good conversationalist. Maybe you're um, affectionate, you're thoughtful, you're caring, making a list. And then this is, so I guess this is along the lines of affirmations, except it's real. These things already exist within you. It's more of now it's just time to acknowledge and appreciate them. And so it can help, I'm a, you know, you guys, I'm a big fan of affirmations. I'm a big fan of also doing this exercise of kind of um, getting more supportive, empowered references and beliefs. So you can do flashcards, which I would recommend. I think that's a great way to do it. And writing down every single thing that you can to support this new belief that yes, uh, that you do have a lot to offer, that you are a good catch, that there's a lot that's right about you. And then going through these flashcards multiple times a day until it starts to sink in. The beauty with this exercise is because it's already true, it makes it a lot easier to, to kind of let that absorb versus some affirmations. 
um, can feel so pie in the sky, it can just feel like wishful thinking or, uh, you know, yeah, basically just wishful thinking. But if you're telling yourself stuff that you are sincere about, you know what? Yeah, I'm a good friend. I listen. I care. I, um, you know, these are, these are all of the things right about me. You keep feeding your brain all of that positivity. It does eventually start to sink in. So that's my two cents. Does anybody else have anything else as far as helping with insecurity after this? Gigi says, yes, a reaffirmation of your self-truths. That's a great way to sum that up. Yeah. Uh, Agatha says that she goes to the Bible and reads what God says about her. Uh, this always helps me to figure out who she is and to feel better about herself. That could be a good way to do it as well. Let's see, Damien is here. Welcome, James, Jack, Crystal. Uh, oh, I'm going to say the name wrong. Z Z Zao Yu? Zao Yu? Says, I have to go now. I just want to drop in, talk for a bit. Have a good day. <laughs> in and out. Okay, good night. Have a, have a good day too. Uh, let's see here. Let me scroll up. Um, let's scroll and scroll and scroll in here. Oh, that's awesome to hear, Allison. She says, hey, Dana, I emailed you a year ago telling you how you helped me realize I was in an abusive relationship and I was working to get out. I left roughly six months ago and these videos helped me continue on. That just makes my heart smile. How are you doing six months out? Any, any um, tips or tricks for anybody else out there that might be in this, a similar position thinking about leaving and um, kind of struggling to? Okay, let's see, I'm gonna uh, scroll up here. Uh, that's a good question. Doris asks, since narcissism is so well known, do narcissists ever back down since their behavior is known? Um, it, it depends. It's more, it's not so much whether or not it's known, it's whether or not it works. Hold on. I'm going to take this necklace off. This is just that much better. Um, yeah. So it's, it has more to do, I think, with whether or not what they're doing works. And also I would say the degree of self-awareness that they have. If, if we're talking kind of your run of the mill narcissist, the vast majority of them don't have any insight. They, they truly, they lack self-reflection. They, <laughs> their uh, emotional intelligence is just really not there. So they never see it's them that they're, that anything that they're doing is a problem. And because they never see that they acknowledge that anything that they're doing is a problem. They don't have any motivation to do anything different. So um, they don't back down because they're able to just do the mental gymnastics required to convince themselves that they're not the problem. And, you know, that's, there's no working with that at all. You're just dealing with a person who's not in, in reality. Okay, let's see. Let's scroll down here. Yeah, Phoenix Rescue says, I still struggle, but I'm doing, I'm going on 10 months out and I can say, do it. The best thing and blessing you can give yourself is to take care and love yourself. I couldn't see it at first, but I do now. Yes, that's probably one of the most overlooked pieces of advice in all of this is self-care, is the importance of tripling up 
quadrupling up on self-care. It's so incredibly important and it's helpful. This was something I was terrible about uh, really kind of both times that I went through this, but having the realization of, you know what, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of things that are uncertain in my life right now. But the one thing that I do know for sure is that I will never look back at this point in my life and think, boy, I really wish I would have worried about this more. I really wish I would have uh, been more stressed out. I really wish I would have, you know, uh, taken worse care of myself. Like that was one thing I knew for sure, for sure. Like I was never going to look back and think, boy, I really, you know, wish I would have pushed myself harder or, or any of that. Like I knew that the future me was going to look back and think, boy, I really wish I would have been kinder to myself that I would have made some time to just put the weight of all of this down and allow myself to, to just relax or to try to go and have some fun, even though I didn't feel like it, um, that I didn't need to stay so wrapped up in all of that stress and anxiety and um, bro feeling broken. Like I could actually go out and do things in life. I didn't have to wait until I felt a hundred percent to start doing those things again. Okay, let's see here. Oh, very good, David. He says he's writing out a list of his hundred best qualities. He's still adding to his. That's that is fantastic. That's a that's a that's quite the exercise to come up with a hundred different qualities. But I like that. It really gets you thinking. Oh, thank you, Jack, for that. He says um, the X in Pinyin or Mandarin Chinese is pronounced sh, so it would be Xiao Yu, Xiao. Okay. Shall you? I will try to remember that. Shall you? Um, okay, let's see. Oh, scrolling. Bonnie asks, uh, why do the narcissists always say you're crazy? when you don't go along with them or you go no contact because they only see things from their point of view. So it's, it's, I think it's just difficult for, for kind of quote unquote, normal balanced people to understand the extent of, maybe just say the limited world of view of a narcissist. It's them. And that's it. That's it. That's it. It's all about them all of the time. It's, they are always right. Everybody else is always wrong. I think if you can try to imagine a small child, you know, a three or a four-year-old, they just, they want what they want. And but it, that's not even really being fair to three or four-year-olds because they're learning to share and take each other into consideration. Narcissists, it's just all about them all the time. If they can justify it in their head, then that's their new reality. Like they literally re rewrite reality on the fly. So they don't understand because they've been able to justify it to themselves. So let's say they've, I don't know, they've stolen $20,000 from you, right? And um, you break up with them, <laughs> you find out and you divorce them. And then they're like, they get upset. How dare you do this to me? Uh, look, look at everything else I've done for you. Uh, you know, I... Uh, I uh, helped finance this car and, you know, I was really nice um, to your dog that I hated and, you know, and I said, I was sorry. And in their mind, they just, they don't understand. They just don't, they don't comprehend <laughs> consequences for their actions because they can justify them to themselves. But if you were to do the same thing to them, they would be livid. So it's just, it's just part of the pathology of it all. Um, but it's the, the level of selfishness has no end. And I think, again, that's something that it's really difficult for normal, decent people to understand because our selfishness does have an end. There's 
people, you know, normally we all can be selfish, but there's that line that we don't cross. And for them, there that line's not there. It's just they take and they take and they take until their wants are satisfied, which they never are. Uh, let's see. Let me scroll up. Okay, Damien asks, how can we make the difference from taking care of ourselves and overspending on this or that on the long term? What's the boundaries for you? Are you are you talking like financially, financially overspending? And if so, for I guess I'm I'm confused. So so set me straight here. Okay. So so if I'm if I'm understanding you correctly, so basically how do we take care of ourselves right now? How do we triple up on self-care uh but doing it in a financially responsible way? Is that what you're talking about? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and answer that, assuming that that's the direction that you were heading. If it's not, then set me straight, okay? And then we'll go in another direction. But as, as far as self-care and, okay, that's what you're talking about. Okay, as far as like financing uh, or spending money on self-care, I'm a big fan of always being financially responsible. Um, so, and self-care doesn't have to be things that cost money or cost a lot of money. You can watch uh, relaxation videos on YouTube before you go to bed at night. You can listen to a, your favorite podcast on your way to work. You can, instead of going out to lunch with coworkers, you can shut your office door and just turn the lights off and give yourself some downtime. You can um, stop talking to what happened Stop talking about what happened to you to people that don't understand, excuse me, don't understand or aren't supportive. That's a, that's a huge, that's huge. That's probably one of the top things that you can do for self-care, frankly. Uh, you can allow yourself to sleep in. You can allow yourself to get up early. You can take, a, you know, a bath or an extra shower or go for a walk or, uh, you know, yeah. Any, any number of things. So, so I would prioritize it. If money is, you know, if you're on a budget and you're like, okay, well, you know what? I only have this much money, but I really feel that I need so much for self-care. Maybe you feel like you need time off work. That's something that a lot of people struggle with or that um, you really want to get you know, I don't know, join a gym and go to yoga and do all these things that cost money. I would say, I would say to do it in a way that's not going to put you in a financial bind down the road. So if you can, if you're really stressed out at work, you know, then maybe talking to your boss and saying, Hey, you know what, uh, is there any way I can take some leave or take starting to take every, I don't know, every Monday off or every Friday off. So you're give, or maybe doing that once or twice a month. So you're just giving yourself a three day weekend, something to look forward to, something that you can just slow down a little bit to catch your breath, these kinds of things. Um, let's see. Uh, Nicole says, Dana, last week you talked about having actual fun, and I realized that I hadn't for quite a while. Shortly after that, a friend called and we went to an improv show. It was the best advice ever. Thanks. I am so glad for you. Yeah, improv shows are a riot. So I'm glad you were able to go do that. Yeah, having fun is important. And I think it's one of those things, you know, when you don't feel like it, after you've been through an abusive relationship, most people, myself included, you know, you want to just kind of hunker down, you want to isolate, you don't want to be around people, you don't want to spend the energy to, to, to do anything other than the bare minimum. And you just want to be alone to kind of just, you know, be there and lick your wounds, basically. And 
and that's okay for a time, but making fun a priority is so huge. This is something that I've really, the more I think about it, the more I really strongly feel that it's, it's a top need. It really should be in Maslow's hierarchy. It's, it's so important because, you know, people walk around, we're all anxious and depressed and have all these other issues going on. But, you know, you ask, ask most adults, you know, when was the last time they really had fun? And a lot of them will struggle with that. Or their fun is somehow tied up in doing what their kids want to do for fun. Like other kids want to go to showbiz pizza or their kids had a party. Like, no, for you, like what adult kind of fun stuff improv shows, uh, escape rooms. There's a new craze going around, which is hatchet throwing, which is something that I will never do because I will wind up in the hospital, I'm sure. But you know, whatever is, is fun for you, making that, a, making that a priority. It's great for dopamine. It's, you know, and it's a, it makes you feel fun and it makes you feel young and it makes you feel alive. And that feeling is something that stays with you for quite a while. So that having fun is time and money well spent. One of the things that I did back when I was really struggling with all of this was I had to kind of separate the pain that I was experiencing from myself. And because I was making myself nuts, all of the anxiety, all of just the ruminating thoughts, all of this, all of the stress, it was just exhausting and debilitating, it helped me to view all of this pain, all of the, the stress, the worry, the pain, all of it as weight in a backpack. So, and to really think about, okay, how much does this backpack weigh? Oh, it feels like it weighs about 50 pounds. Okay. This, all of this weight is, it's anxiety about the future and it's worry and anger about the past. Like none of this is now, none of this is this very moment. It might be a very near future moment, but it's not this exact moment. And realizing that and realizing that I could take the backpack off and that I could pick it up and put it back on again helped tremendously because I felt like I couldn't go out. My brain was at such a place where I felt like I couldn't stop, stop worrying because that felt irresponsible. Because it felt like I need to worry because I need to figure this stuff out. And if I stop worrying, then I'm not going to figure out anything. And then things are just going to get worse. And so that just left me stuck feeling anxious and worried all the time. But then realizing, you know what? You can take a break from that. You can put all of that anxiety, that worry, that stress, you can put it down for an hour or two hours. You can go to an improv show. And you know what? When you come, you come back, you can pick it back up again and carry it around if you want. And I think just making that distinction really, really helped. Um, let's see. Purple Belt says, my friend is married to an angry manipulator and wants a divorce, but keeps chickening out. She warned him that she was going to, which we all know is a bad idea with an angry narcissist. She's afraid of him and doubts herself. Yeah. Well, you know, I can completely understand why she's scared to go. I mean, divorce, even under amazing terms, when both people are like, you know what, this isn't working. We're two different people going in two different directions. Even with that, it's still profoundly scary because it's something new. You know, you get used to navigating the world as in this role. Like, okay, I'm a, I'm a wife or I'm a husband. I'm a part of a married couple. You have your routine. You have, even though things might be stressful, it's still, it's predictable. And there's a high degree of comfort in what's predictable. So it's always, it's always difficult to leave what's safe, even if what's safe is dangerous. That's kind of the big, um, what kind of messes with your head in these kinds of relationships like that. So if he is, um, you know, a, a dangerous, potentially dangerous guy and, 
she's afraid of him and doubts herself, what can help is to come up with a plan. So a safety plan that she does not share with him and to realize, okay, you know what? And I think to take the pressure off. So I, I for sure wouldn't let her know. I wouldn't use the language like, oh, you're chickening out. Um, I think her fear is very valid. Uh, and it, it's not a sign of, of weakness. It's, I think it's a sign of legitimate concern. So really taking that seriously and being like, okay, let's come up with the, let's come up with a safety plan. If you were to leave, you don't need to leave tomorrow. You will, no pressure. You, you know, you'll know when the time is right. If you were to leave, let's come up with some sort of plan. So like what all would be involved in that? You know, can you start putting money aside? If so, where could you put it? Uh, who would you stay with? In what ways could you go about protecting yourself? And just kind of, you know, working towards assembling that plan. It's a lot. It's a lot. You know, you hear you have a traumatized person and traumatized people aren't thinking clearly anyhow because you're in fight or flight mode. And so you're in fight or flight mode and you're having to make a dozen major life decisions, which just further fuels all of that anxiety about whether or not to stay or go. Because then you're just absolutely in overwhelm and you're in fight or flight. It's, a, it's I think we all that have been there can relate to that. It's a terrifying, awful place to be. So uh, it can help to kind of go through and brainstorm, okay, well, well, what would happen? Where could you go? How much would you need to have saved up? Where could you keep these funds? This kind of thing. What, what would you need if you were to leave? The, the biggest thing with trying to think as clearly as you possibly can is to, to release as much fear as you possibly can. So getting, for me, one of the ways that helps to do that is to think about worst case scenario. Like, okay, well, if I left this person and let's say um, they drained the accounts and they trashed the house and you know this, that, and the other, okay, that's you know, outside of them killing you, right? Like they destroy everything. Then what, how would you handle that? Okay, I could, increase the insurance on the house for starters. I could take pictures of the house before I leave that have a time date stamp on them and leave them with an attorney or with a friend or whoever. I could um, have a police do a civil standby where they just come and hang out with you while you're packing your stuff and while you leave. Okay, I could see about maybe going and staying with somebody who lives in another state just kind of brainstorming how how could you handle this uh let's see yeah free kevin saying yes fear will keep you prisoner yeah it really will And Bonnie says, it's really hard to make drastic changes the older you are. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot of things to consider. And, um, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it's never easy to up and go. And it's, um, every person is dealing with different, uh, kind of factors at play. So religion, children, finances, culture, uh, you know, you name it. My mom ha still has a, a good friend of hers who was married to a guy for several decades. And um, she, um, they had children. Anyways, he had multiple affairs. He had multiple, he had multiple families, not just another family, multiple families with multiple women, crazy. And she was terrified to leave because she was, they were are of a generation where if you were a woman, you got married and the man handled all of that. So my grandmother was in the same boat. She had no idea. 
She had no bank account. She had no car. Uh, you know, at that, in my grandmother's time, you know, if you're a woman, you couldn't get credit. You had to be married to get credit. So she couldn't get a mortgage. She couldn't, she had no credit. She was a stay at home mom the whole time they were married, you know, things like this. It's, it's, there are challenges out there. All of these challenges can be overcome. It's just a matter of, uh, I think, kind of realizing what the challenges are, putting a face on that. What are the challenges? And then starting to kind of think, okay, what can you do? So it's not easy, but it is possible. Misty Lee says, I left the narcissist about six weeks ago. I've been feeling really lonely lately, having trouble remembering the bad times, starting to think that I made the wrong choice, even though logically I didn't. Yeah, that's very common. And, you know, I'm a big fan. I encourage people to um, make a list. I call it the for when you miss him or her list and you and put it in bullet point format. All of the reasons that this needs to end. This person um, stole your daughter's college fund. They kicked your dog. They, um, you know, every single thing that they were doing, all of the reasons. They had got your best friend pregnant. They, you know, all of these things. They lied to you about being, uh, they said that they had never been married before, but then you find out they'd really been married twice before these kinds of things, write all that down. And then when that nostalgia does kick in, because it generally does, it's, I just refer to it as kind of like a craving. It's, you know, like quitting smoking or drinking or anything else, you're going to have cravings. So it helps to anticipate how you're going to handle that when it happens. So when that nostalgia kicks in, then you pull that letter out and you reread it and it'll generally wake you up. Be like, oh, right, right. Like, that's why I can't go back. Um, okay, let me scroll up here. Yes, Agatha was talking about the book that we're reading and there's a, I'm sorry, it is so freaking hot in here. Um, there's a part in the book where he talks about the inner critic and we'll, we're going to be discussing all of this tomorrow, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time Book Club. Uh, he says, shame is what feeds the inner critic. And grief is how you disarm the critic. Yes. And I love that so much. It's so, 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 so spot on. It's weird when you think of it that way. I think at first, this is one of the, we're going to, again, we're going to address a lot of this stuff tomorrow, but one of the things that we were talking about with regards to the book is for people that are new to healing or I think to this con, I don't know, I say this concept, like psychology, <laughs> this giant uh, personal growth, like this, all of this stuff a lot of this book in particular, because it's so chock full of information, he does such a deep dive into it, it can sound like psychobabble. And so it's one of those books, I just really encourage people, if you're going to read it now, go back and read it in six weeks or six months from now. And do that, do that, read this book. Here's my two cents, read this book every six months for the next six years. I guarantee you're going to be get, taking new things away from it every single time. This is the third time I've read this book over the past four years and still new takeaways. It's, there's just so much in it. Love it, love it, love it. Um, 
let's see here. Oh, so I was going to talk a little bit about the inner critic and they were saying, uh, or Pete Walker in his book was talking about how shame feeds the inner critic, which kind of cycles back to what we were talking about at the beginning of this live stream in terms of um, feeling insecure with dating again and, and these kinds of things. And um, a lot of that has to do with shame. It's shame and embarrassment. It's these feelings of inadequacy and that inner critic it's amazing because sometimes sometimes that voice is very loud and clear and other times it's not. Other times it's just kind of this, these feelings we might have where it's not necessarily, it doesn't come across as um, like clear or identifiable messages to us. It's just these feelings of I'm not good enough. So yeah, that stems from shame. And uh, then he was talking about, you know, you uh, kind of, healing or resolving that inner critic is, is done through grieving and grieving. Oh gosh, I'm so sorry. I'm so freaking out. Uh, grieving, grie just all of it for staying as long as you did, for not seeing this person clearly for, um, the relate for grieving the relationship that you thought you had, the relationship that you thought you could have, uh, all of it, you know, like all any of us can do is is the best we can at any given time and it's difficult it's difficult when you don't realize that these people exist and it's you know difficult to be on the lookout for them um uh josiah am i saying that right hosea <laughs> oh i'm so sorry uh asks what book it is Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker is the book. Jack or James says, it's time to get a window unit or stand up AC. Air conditioning is being installed, I believe June 4th. So it's, yeah, this house is really, really warm. We have no fans in here. <laughs> uh, Jennifer says, shame was a big topic in my therapy session today. It's so hard for me to talk about it. I hate it, especially when she wanted to know if I wanted to talk about sexuality, but I just can't. It's even hard for me to talk about it with my boyfriend. I don't know how to talk to her about it. Well, you know, and I think... The term, were you here, Jennifer, last week we were talking about intimacy and different forms of intimacy and um, maybe that could be a way to start in on that conversation. So what we were talking about at the beginning of the live stream last week was this class I was just in, it's taught by a sex therapist and she's been a sex therapist for 30, 40 years she's fantastic. She's just, I could listen to her talk all day long. She's just, just so interesting. Anyways, she was saying that um, a lot of the couples, the vast majority of the couples that came in to see her would come in for what they thought were sex issues. Um, kind of just a lack of chemistry or uh, just kind of um, performance concerns, I guess you could say, in the bedroom. And, but she said, you know, the vast majority of the time, it ended up being that they were struggling with intimacy in other areas. And that kind of had the spillover effect into the bedroom. So she had said, you know, there's, um, there is like social intimacy which is spending time with this other person, enjoying their company. There's financial intimacy where you're talking about money and kind of goals and say what you save your money on or how you save, how much money you save, um, how you spend your money, what, you know, your financial priorities, these kinds of things. Um, emotional intimacy, sharing and sharing your honest feelings with the other person in a tactful, appropriate way. 
uh, physical intimacy. So just, you know, snuggling, holding hands, cuddling. And then there's also what, what I think most Americans, what we think of when we think of intimacy or sexuality, we tend to think of it as just sex and it's not, it's so much more than that. So uh, I think that can be, because here's the thing, after that class, I was really doing a lot of kind of self-reflection on what she'd said and kind of just thinking about how this pertains in my own life and um, realizing, I think if a person is shut down in one area, odds are they're shut down in multiple areas when it has to do with intimacy with another person. And in certain situations, it can be a fear of getting hurt again. So we keep these different walls up. Um, you know, if you're talking stuff that's stemming from childhood abuse, that makes sense. It's sort of like, I, you know, the fear of actually relating to um, opening, making yourself vulnerable to another person can be terrifying if that was, if that vulnerability was ever used to hurt you in the past. Yeah. And Free Kevin says, yeah, it's difficult to be intimate with someone you don't trust. It is. I would, and I would say it's probably, you know, not just difficult. I don't, I don't even know if it's truly possible. Um, and if it would definitely be a like modified form of intimacy where that person's just sharing what they feel safe with sharing. So, but they're still, they're still probably hiding a lot because they're afraid. Oh, okay. Free Kevin says, yeah, impossible is what I meant. Uh, let's see. Yeah. And that makes sense. Doris says, you know, Dana, when my ex left and discarded me, all I could think of was everything was fake. So fake. I was mad at myself for letting my ex treat me so bad. The verbal abuse was horrible. Yeah, I, you know, I think a lot of people struggle with this because it's sort of, you know, when you start after the relationship ends and you just start seeing things clearly, it's like, how did I get here? How did I allow, how and why did I allow somebody to talk to me like that? How did I not see that that was a problem at the time? How and why did I justify these things? How... Um, you know, like what the hell it's, it's just, it, it, it's difficult. It's difficult to understand like how things could have gotten to that point. And then it's even more, I think it can be even more angering when it's sort of like, you know, and how did other people justify this? Like would it, maybe if the times you did reach out for help and other people made it seem like, oh, this is just a normal, you know, uh, couples issue. And you're like, no, this is so far beyond that. I think there's there's different levels of anger and there's different types of anger uh, reserved for different people. And that's part of the grieving, I think the grieving process, like angry at ourselves, angry at maybe a therapist, angry at possibly your spiritual leader, family, friends, your ex, all of that. There's lots of anger, lots of understandable anger there. Yes, Kevin, you are so right about this. He says, in English, we seem to have all encompassing words for complex subjects like love. Um, oh, uh, very little more descriptive words. Yes. Yes, I agree. That's always been, in, you know, interestingly enough, it's a lot of the complex subjects surrounding love. You've got love, friendship, forgiveness, um, compassion, a lot of these terms are so, they're so huge that they, there's no, I mean, like there's no room for um, kind of the distinction between the different types. Like, it's weird that I can say, I love seltzer water and I love my brother. Obviously there's, well, I don't know. I really do like seltzer water. <laughs> so I don't know. It might, that, that one might be a bad example. That might be neck and neck, but uh, I'm just kidding. Um, 
you know, but they're different. So there's different levels of the way we love certain things, but we only have one word for that. And that's, that's a problem because our language shapes our reality. If we don't have the words to describe something, it, it very quickly, things become very confusing very quickly to other people and to ourselves. Uh, let's see, Crystal says, I've heard that depression is unresolved anger. And local tourist is saying, yes, depression is anger turned inward. And Gigi is saying, yeah, depression can be anger turned inward or a response to a toxic environment. Yes, I agree. You know, it's, I think that's part of it. Um, I think also a chemical imbalance is also a very real thing. I've worked with many patients over the years who had extreme, um, well, I mean, bipolar one, bipolar two, or extreme chronic major depression. And I mean, therapy is only gonna get a person so far if, if it's a chemical imbalance, it's a chemical imbalance and doing exercise and eating right and all that's only going to take a person so far. I've, I mean, I've seen this multiple times. You get a person on the right medication and boom, they're a different person within a month. So, but yeah, I think uh, depression for sure can be, I think a lot of depression does stem from unresolved hurt and pain and that person is just not comfortable with expressing it. I think that's a very real thing. Yeah. Gigi says, yeah, aside from a chemical imbalance. The fairy magic says, how do you measure the chemical imbalance? You know, that's a really fantastic question. And as of the year 2019, you don't. Um, hopefully, I think it would be fantastic uh, in the future that there would be some sort of way that you could measure a person's serotonin levels or dopamine levels or um, things like this and, and kind of see what's going on. They have tests now that they normally don't do because they're expensive, but it's um, to, to do like a genetic profile. It's like a DNA, oh, it is a DNA test. They take a swab from the inside of your cheek and it comes back with what medications are um, most likely according to your genetic profile to work for you. So I've only seen that test done, I mean, less than a handful of times. And it was on people that were um, like really struggling with some pretty major mental illness who had been just medication was not working. And doctors were just kind of at wits end with trying to feed they were just at a loss of i don't you know they don't know what else to do um right and fairy magic says yeah there is no test for bipolar it's assumed based on behaviors yes same, I'm trying to think if there's any mental illness out there that isn't that way. Nothing comes to mind. Like right now, it's it's basically, okay, looking at a person's behavior and being like, okay, yeah, this this is kind of what this, this actually looks like schizophrenia or this looks like bipolar one or this looks like schizoaffective or, you know, and this is, this is the challenge for so many, so many of us out there that have mental health issues is because it's not, it's not as precise as medical science where you can, let's say, do blood work. And then it comes back of, oh, okay, your white blood cell count is this, or your blood glucose level is this, or your, you know, your blood pressure is this. And then you have that specific number and then it's like, okay, based on this number, this is the protocol. It's just so much more specific and it's so much easier to rule stuff out when you're looking at a, like a medical workup than it is like a mental health workup. 
Free Kevin was saying, I read somewhere that your state of mind can affect your hormone levels. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're in a good mood, you're going to be releasing dopamine. Um, that's one of the reasons exercise can be so incredibly effective for depression. So, um, Yeah, and that's the challenge too. Jennifer was saying, I wish my mom got on bipolar medication a long time ago. She's bipolar one. And if you ever tried to get her to come to terms with it, she'd get so aggressive, which is why I never said anything. It's difficult. That's it's so challenging when you have somebody and a lot of people, a lot of, it's difficult. It's difficult to fully accept that there is some sort of mental health diagnosis. I, I don't I don't know if I've ever come across somebody that was completely accepting right out of the gate that they had that. The vast majority of people out there, myself included, tend to really fight that. And then they'll think, oh, well, you know what? I got this. It turns out this depression, it was just situational. I'm fine now. Or you know what? Um, I'm going to start exercising. I'm going to eat clean. I'm going to do, I'm going to fast. I'm going to pray. I'm going to do all of these different things. And then that'll help. And then you know, that might help for a little bit and then it doesn't. So, uh, or there, I'm going to go the all natural route, or I'm going to start going to acupuncture or, or what have you. And, um, you know, the, I, I have, I don't think I've ever seen alternative stuff work for major, you know, bipolar one, bipolar two, schizophrenia, that kind of stuff. So uh, Agatha had asked, Oh, wait, wait. actually, I was going to talk about it. It's so challenging. So if you have a person that doesn't accept their diagnosis um, and sometimes and here's what's so wild about this, too, is different people. Everybody has their own level of insight into their behavior. Um, and it's, it has nothing to do with emotional intelligence. It has nothing to do with intelligence. It's just it's bizarre how across the board it can be. I. Um, I've had patients that were incredibly, I mean, when they were doing well, they were clear, they were coherent, they were intelligent. They, you would not have guessed in a million years that they struggled with anything. When they weren't well, they would get real, to the point they would need to be hospitalized. They would get really sick really fast and do all kinds of just, you know, extreme behavior. And they were not, they just did not have that insight when it was going on, how bad things were. And then I've had other patients who were, um, who had, I would say, limited insight as a baseline, but when they weren't doing well, they knew it. And they would call the next, that the, the moment that they started to feel themselves slipping, they're like, you know what, these meds aren't working, um, or I forgot to take a dose or two, or they, they knew they had that insight. It's, it's strange. It's strange how that works. Uh, Agatha had asked, don't they check vitamin levels? Not every doctor or psychiatrist or nurse practitioner checks vitamin levels. I think it's becoming more mainstream to check for vitamin D because vitamin D functions um, uh, as a hormone just helps everything else work better. So that at least here in Michigan, where we have vitamin D issues, I don't know if they, they check for vitamin D in California or Hawaii, but we definitely check it out here. Um, vitamin B, there, but here's the iron is another big one that, I mean, like so many things can affect a person's mood. It's just absolutely wild for women, our hormones, um, if it's, you know, that time of the month or if a woman's going through uh, menopause, that can really throw a person off. Um, uh, blood glucose levels, that's huge for mood. It's really common for people, uh, you know, um, when they're pre-diabetic or they even diabetic and before they're diagnosed with it, before they know how to treat it, or they're like, man, I'm just, they're irritable all the time. People are like, man, their mood swings are just off the charts. And, um, you know, and then there's 
like other health issues, you know, they're having to urinate all the time, they're hungry all the time, they're dropping weight, you know, these kinds of things. So, you know, just kind of, yeah, the brain, the human body is, it's really, it's like a high end sports car, you know, and we only have a limited understanding of it at this point in time. Let's see, Jennifer was saying there really should be a word between like and love. Talking about differentiating. Yes, I agree. I agree. There should be. I'm a big fan. You guys have heard me probably talk about this of um, differentiating between like an acquaintance and a friend. Friend is another one of those words. And I'm, I, I still... I try to catch myself now because it does, it does make a difference describing a person who's actually an acquaintance as a friend. So if we keep referring to this person as a friend, when really we don't know them, they just happen to be nice or I don't know, we see them in the halls at work or at school or what have you, you know, if a friend, and this is what, this is, I really believe, I, I believe all stuff is so interconnected. If we're being very casual with terms like this, and this is part of that slippery slope when people down the road, they're like, well, can I be friends with my ex? And it's sort of like, how are you defining the word friend? Because can you, if we're talking friendship, being open, honest, sincere communication, there's that level of trust there, um, you know, the sharing with the other person, these kinds of things. To me, that's what a friend is. Somebody that you can call and say, you know, hey, can you talk? Or, hey, can you listen? that to me is a friend. An acquaintance is somebody that you might, I don't know, go out drinking with, but if you ever really needed anything, you wouldn't call them. Or you carpool with them to work, but you really don't click with them. Like you wouldn't hang out with them if they weren't working there. So just kind of getting clear in your own mind, whatever your definitions are of, of these different terms. So we're using these words appropriately. So this stuff doesn't get all, all blurry. Uh, so let me scroll up here. Yeah, Bonnie was saying that she had to reevaluate what a friend was. Narcissists are definitely not friends. Yes. Oh, I like that. I like that differentiation, Julie. She says, to me, pretty refers to the outer aesthetic. Beautiful has more to do with character. Yes, I like that. I would agree. Yeah, Agatha says I'm now she's very specific about who she calls a friend and who hears me say I love you. Yeah, I agree. There's certain words and that I I'm I guard. I really value that and I don't want to use them casually because they mean a lot to me. Uh let's see. Yes, I agree. Purple Belt was saying, try functional medicine um, where they check hormones, vitamins, all thyroid levels, cortisol, et cetera, rule out health issues before we call ourselves crazy. Yeah, I think that's important to, to rule out uh, stuff like that. And really like a good, um, you know, I would say like a good psychiatrist or especially psych, if you're going for psych med kind of stuff, really should be doing that because uh, these things can play a part. So it's important. 
Um, let's see here. Okay, go scrolling up. Local tourist says, yeah, there are natural antidepressants such as chocolate. Yes, that can, that can help to some extent. I think it, you know, um, I think it depends on the level of depression and the person and the degree. So the degree and frequency, I guess, of the, of a person's depression. I was talking to a friend the other day about uh, my depression, because that's something I've been very open about. It's something I've struggled with all my life that I can really, I mean, it really started to get bad around the age of 13. I was hospitalized for it twice. I probably should have been hospitalized for it another handful of times, to be honest, over the years. And when I experience, I think my depression is largely chemical. I really, really do. I think there's you know, I'm sure I could dig and come up with some other issues, but that could pertain to it. But I really strongly feel that there's a huge chemical component to it. Um, I don't, I don't feel sad. I don't feel tearful. I don't feel, I don't even necessarily feel numb. I was, so I was describing it to my friend the other day of, it feels like the, if you guys have seen the movie, Get Out, where the guy goes to like the sunken place when the woman's clanging on her teacup and he just starts just fading away, basically. That's how I feel. I feel like there's, it's just the weirdest thing. It's like, I just start fading into myself and I get lost in there and I can't find my way out. And I just lose all motivation to even try. It's terrible. It's terrible. And it's just, just get get lost in it. Um, let's see. People are talking about a fan. They're like, Dana, you need a desktop fan or something. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Let's see. If I have unopened mail, <laughs> I can fan myself. Oh, that's so much better. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, let's, let, me, let me scroll up here. Um, Frankendall says we have a troll on here. Okay, if I see him, I'll get rid of him. Or Bonnie or free from narc abuse, if you can. I don't know if you guys can remove people or if it's just me. Uh, let's see. Bonnie asked Dana, why do narcissists always are always become jealous and are in competition with others? It's, I think it, it's just really their personality. You know, it's their mindset. There's just kind of this unhealthy ego that never fully formed. And so I think if you view it as there's really two main types of mindsets out there, you have people that are team oriented, which I refer to as kind of just your normal, quote unquote, normal, decent people, team oriented, they can work well with others, there's compromise, you can negotiate with them, you can reason with them. And then there's people that have a domination driven mentality. And it's this power over mentality at all cost. And sometimes what can be confusing is sometimes that uh, mentality only shows itself in certain ways. So 
it might not always be readily apparent, but um, even, even if it's only there every now and again, where it's like they have to win at the expense of other people at the, just, you know, if it's, if we're not talking healthy competition, right. We're talking like, this is a friendship. This is a coworker. Um, you're in a relationship with somebody and they're trying to destroy you. That's way outside the realm of, you know, normal behavior. And it's just that mindset. Uh, uh, the book that we're going to be discussing tomorrow talks more about this and kind of that locked in fight response that is kind of um, is a predecessor for narcissism. So it's, it's that very simplistic mentality of it's, you know, it's me or it's you. It can't be both of us. It's me or it's you. And for a narcissist, it's always them, which is a problem. And any little thing can make them feel jealous or insecure. It's stuff that like you could, let's say, for example, you're, you both work at the same company and, but in different departments and you get a promotion and they happen to, I don't know, they see this on the, uh, I don't know, job, the website that you're now this other promotion, you've now have this new position. It could very well spark this insane jealousy in them. And now next thing you know, they're, you know, uh, calling into work, filing false claims against you. They're keying your car. They're doing all kinds of things. And you're thinking to yourself, what on earth? They weren't even up for this promotion. Like, we don't even, I wasn't bragging about it. I wasn't rubbing it in. I didn't even mention it. And now this person's making my life a living hell. It's you just, I mean, you, you can't anticipate this kind of stuff with people that have that unhealthy ego. Yeah, free from narc abuses. Yeah, it's that upmanship. Um, Jennifer says, I wonder if narcissists have low self-esteem, like how codependents have low self-esteem, but they show it in a different way. You know, I think it's, it's kind of thought that they do, uh, which is why they're, they're continue. It's this continual compensation for everything because they can't handle criticism. A person that has a healthy sense of self can handle criticism. Uh, they can be accountable. They can, you know, they can work as a team. A person who doesn't have that healthy sense of self or self-esteem can't. They're just, um, you know, they're too defensive. It's generally insecure. People don't try, people that are really compensating for stuff. For example, I had, I won't really name names, but I had a, um, a narcissist in my family who all, it was the weirdest thing. All he wore was um, Ralph Lauren. It was Ralph Lauren everything. Socks, underwear, shirts, slacks, belts, and it was like, I, you, I get it. Like you're a billboard for polo. Like it just, it was so strange to me. And he, you know, um, just was very status oriented. And I think a lot of that just stemmed from deep insecurity. Now, do they realize that they have such low self-esteem? I don't know. My guess would almost be no because they tend to lack that ability to self-reflect. It's, um, so I don't know if I necessarily feel too bad <laughs> for them about it because I just don't think that they're even aware of it because they get rid of, they get rid of any uncomfortable feeling very quickly. And they just, they, cause they justify it. Um, so, cause they don't, when a person's in fight mode, it, they're not open to exploring their feelings. They're defensive. Uh, let's see here. Let me, let me scroll up.
Yep. Jeffrey says, the narcissists think life is a competition. They want to come in first place on the stupidest things. Yep, they do. It's it's weird. And again, they'll hold the weirdest grudges against you. You could not, you, you could have done something completely, <laughs> not even realizing that you would even spark something, light some sort of fire in them and they can just go on a rampage and hold it against you for decades. It's, they're just, there's no working with this kind of stuff. Um, Okay, so Jeffrey, I missed part of what you said. You said, uh, it sounds kind of like disassociation. Oh, were you talking about my depression? Disassociation, Dana, could have that something to do with it. It's not disassociation. It's, um, I don't even know how to describe it. It's, it's like I can feel my inner, this is, this is going to sound really weird. <laughs> so just bear with me, but you know how normally when you're going through life, this, this seriously is going to, Oh my God, this sounds so crazy. Um, you, I can't even, I cannot even say this out loud because it sounds so wild. I'll, let me just phrase it this way. When I start really feeling depressed, it's this, it's almost like my, <laughs> like I have an inner being. It's seriously like the movie Get Out. Like there's, there's this, this inner self and then there's the outer self, okay? And normally on when you're going through life, your inner, I, I guess normally I feel like my inner and outer self are one. Like I would wear my outer self like a, like a suit, like a well-fitting jacket. I don't notice a difference. When I start feeling really, really depressed, there starts, it's like my inner self just starts to pull away. And I can, there's like this shell of the outside, but the inside, it's just complete and total like withdrawal. Like, I, I don't even, it's not necessary. It's not like numbness, but maybe that's kind of what's close to it is I've become very apathetic. I just truly just stop caring about so many things and I have no motivation. It's sort of like when you slump down into the couch on a Sunday and you're just done, like you just don't even care about anything. You're like, I am going to ser seriously sit here for the next 26 hours and watch Game of Thrones, and then all of Breaking Bad. <laughs> like I'm going to do nothing. And you just, you become a slug on the couch. That's how it feels, but it's inside. It's weird. I know. I, but I don't think it's disassociation. And it's not caused by anything. That's why I really feel like it's just, um, it's a chemical thing. Because it's not situational and it's not, uh, it's just kind of happens to me. Like when I start getting really depressed, I, there's, there's like different degrees of depression that I struggle with. That, what I was describing then is severe and it takes all my energy to do anything, to shower, to leave the house, to do anything. Thankfully, that's not, um, you know, like an everyday thing. It's, that's more an extreme Frank and Dahl says, I'm the same way. It's almost paralyzing. Uh, Salon was saying, could it be dysphoria? Hey, Lydia says, you're describing a fragmented self. It's, it's not, it's, I mean, it, it sounds like that, but I swear to God, it's not that. Um, 
I don't know. I really, I'd have to look up. I'd be curious to know kind of what a severe, a severe, uh, I don't know, serotonin deficit or something, how they describe it. So, uh, it just feels, I don't know. It feels like your soul is like leaving your body. That's maybe that's a better way to describe it. It's just, ugh, it's awful, freaking awful. Uh, Buzzing Bee, that's a great question, says, how long can they do the love bombing? It depends. It depends um, on the person doing it. So, you know, if you're talking like an online scammer, it tends to not be very long because they don't want to waste their time. They can move on to somebody, excuse me, they can move on to somebody else. But uh, in real life, normally they can do the love bombing until they wear down the target. So I guess if the deeper question there is if you are being love bombed and you're trying to tell, okay, is this person sincere or are they not sincere? The way I look at it is when somebody is really showering you with a lot of compliments and, and these kinds of things, um, you know, especially in the early stages of a relationship, it's nice and it's flattering and all that. I, unless they really, you know, unless they really know you, uh, a lot of it's just pillow talk, you know, I just, just kind of schmooze. And then also realize the, that kind of, you know, oh, this perf, this idealization stage that everybody goes through in a relationship, you know, the first couple months when you're dating a person, and that and that can last a little while too, but generally about three months. It feels like you've met this perfect person. It feels so intense. It feels so amazing. They seem they seem wonderful. You can't find any flaws in them. That's all of those feel good chemicals that ha- that are being released in those early stages of a relationship. There's lots of dopamine again, lots of oxytocin these kinds of things that settles down with time. And then that's when, you know, you start seeing things clearly and you realize, oh, wow, this person uh, isn't perfect, right? They have things about them. They, um, I don't know, they're messy. They, it's the real life, the real life stuff, you know? So I guess what I'm saying is if a person's laying it on really thick, uh, I wouldn't, I mean, like I said, that can be nice to hear or whatever, but I would just realize, uh, you know, that's just probably going to tone down in time. I, I guess I would focus more on, is there a foundation underneath all of that? Cause that's, I think that's the bigger issue. But if you have a total stranger who's telling you, you know, all these, you know, oh, you're so beautiful. You're so amazing. You're so wonderful. I thought I'd never meet anybody like you, blah, blah. Um, then to me, that's just immature because they don't know you. So they're just, they're acting from a place of lust and they don't realize it. Uh, let's see here. We scroll up. (laughs) Jennifer says that what I'm describing with depression, she says, it's like the alien inside the guy's head in men in black. That's a hilarious. Yeah, it is kind of like that. Yes, Dana, other Dana says, uh, yeah, that it's like you're a stranger in your own skin. Yes, that's, the, it's just weird. I, I've i never, like really, I noticed it really bad this last time when I was struggling with depression. I don't know if I've ever like no, noticed it like that before. Um that was when I realized I've, I've got to go do something like this is not, this is just not okay. Uh, 
Um, yeah, life with after narcissists. When I get like that, I become very reclusive and I don't want to leave my house. Yep, I'm the exact same way. I just quit caring. I just literally across the board quit caring. Uh, J Dog says, is criticism emotional abuse? Well, it definitely can be if it's, if it's unwanted and if it's, um, you know, harsh, then yeah. So going around, you know, telling somebody, giving them, you know, a person's unwanted opinion uh, under the guise of, oh, I'm just being honest or I'm, you know, whatever. If it's, if it's coming across in a way that's shaming the other person, then that's abusive. So, and it can be difficult because there's certain situations where, uh, you know, you might want to tell somebody that you care about, like, hey, these are my concerns, um, you know, but it's, so for example, let me give you some more context for this. This is what I see a lot of on YouTube lately is with uh, like the body positivity movement. Here's an example. And people saying like, oh, um, you know, you don't call me fat. Don't call me, don't tell me that I'm unhealthy. Don't say any of this. Um, you know, I don't, they don't want to, you know, they don't want to hear anything because, uh, you know, for a wide variety of reasons. And they get really upset if you were to mention anything. And so, um, so then there's kind of the other side of it, the people that are like, no, no, you need to really accept that you're unhealthy, that this carrying this, this much extra weight is not good for you. Like there's all kinds of damage that you're doing to your body, blah, blah, blah. So like there's these two different sides that are continually at war on the internet. And you know, my take on that is shaming somebody or continually to, continuing to bring up this isn't going to drag them to the truth, isn't going to make them see the light and be like, oh, I should lose weight or get healthy. Like that's, it's not going to work. So it's counterproductive. I think that's another thing to look at whatever actions you're taking, what is the result? If this, because especially in this situation, if a person is already coping with things by eating and gaining weight, shaming them is probably just gonna make them gain more weight. So it's, you know, it's not helpful, even if it might be coming from a place of, you know, care and concern, uh, there's still different ways to get, a, you know, your point across in a way that's tactful and um, coming, from, coming from a place of care and concern, not from a place of shame and blame, because, when anybody is shamed or blamed, they it just pushes them further. It, it, it doesn't help. It just doesn't help. So, um, let's see here. Okay, Jack is saying, I know the stream is busy, but Dana, I genuinely do have a question about narcissistic abuse mingled with sexual abuse. I don't know how to integrate healing between the two. So are you talking about like you've had these, these two different traumatic events that have happened and kind of how to heal, how to heal from them or how to prioritize healing, I guess? I guess my two cents on that would be, I would imagine that there would be a lot of, uh, not imagine, there is, there's a lot of overlap between uh, healing from, from those two types of traumatic abuse, sexual abuse and emotional and psychological abuse. So, um, and my guess is that as you go forward in healing, whatever 
insights and aha moments and strategies and everything that you're gaining, it's going to build upon itself exponentially. So I don't think any of it's necessary, you know, it's not going to be like, I don't think you're going to be going down the wrong track, I guess is what I'm saying. But my guess would also be not my, not my guess, the, a, big, a big part of healing for both of sexual abuse and narcissistic abuse is rediscovering the core of who you are. So I guess if you were to start with that healing process, that, that would be where I would say, Hey, that there, <laughs> like start, start there, because that's, that's a good start. Um, and that's going to encompass, that's going to encompass so much like boundaries, standards, deal breakers, getting in tune with your feelings. Uh, you know, Pete Walker describes his whole process of, of basically processing emotions, um, you know, um, verbally ventilating, so talking it out, getting it out, telling, sharing your experience. Um, uh, what does he call it? Healthy angering. So having anger and also getting that out in a constructive way. So not not getting angry at another person, not to not becoming abusive with anger, but actually, uh, you know, constructively getting angry through journaling, through going for a run, through uh, I don't know, you go into another room and shut the door and you just scream into a pillow, these kinds of things, like really just allowing yourself to get angry and to experience these emotions. Um, grieving is a big one for the pain that was done. Um, just for all of it, for, um, you know, what was taken from you, um, just the hurt, the hurt and the pain, just, gr just grieving, grieving, the whole experience and the process and, and all of it. Um, and what was the last, oh, and then uh, like truly feeling your, just feeling your feelings and getting back in tune with your feelings and acknowledging them when they surface of, yes, this is anger. Yes. This is sadness. This is fear. This is uh, regret. This is guilt. This is whatever. That's kind of the core of, of building up a, a healthy inner self. Um, let's see here. Mm. Jack was saying, Dana, you've talked about intimacy with the cuddling, etc. And my mother was emotionally incestuous. And it was almost sexual about it. Yeah. And so that's, um, that's awful. I am sorry that that happened to you, but you bring up a really a, a good distinction. So everything that we're talking about exists on this continuum. And I think this is one of the things that many survivors of abuse, whether as children or as adults have to kind of navigate is trying to figure out, okay, well then what's healthy in this? So if a person grew up in this household where there was a lot of this kind of um, parentification going on, where you have a parent that's turning the child into either into the parent and then the parent becomes the child. So there's this role reversal, or if the parent is turning the child into a friend um, or another adult or like a substitute spouse and all, all of that's inappropriate. So, um, and, and problematic because kids don't have, you know, um, they're not adults. And so to, especially for like that emotional intimacy, if you have an adult opening up to a child and saying, oh my goodness, here's everything. They're treating them like a, a friend or a therapist. Here's everything that happened to me. And oh my gosh, my own mother was so abusive. And, you know, I went through this, um, I was sexually assaulted when I was 19 and all of this, like it's too much. Or are you talking about your divorce or adult issues with children? Um, it, it's, it's damaging because they don't have, they can't, they're powerless and it's just inappropriate. And then it makes them, 
kind of feel responsible and protective of the parent when really it should be the other way around. Their job is to just be a child and the parent's job is to be a parent. And, you know, those two should not uh, overlap. A uh, street master says, after a decade of living a lie and tons of abuse from a narcissist, is it actually possible to ever fall in love again? I have major trust issues. Um, so, and then Anna <laughs> was saying, Dana, you've been pausing and I look up thinking the screen is frozen and then you blink. <laughs> Sorry, it's been a long day. I am hot and I am tired. So, I, and my little hamster on the wheel is only going so fast. Um, but okay, Street Master, yes, I, I do. I really do think that it is possible to fall in love again. But we're talking about two different things here. So, the trust issue, one of the biggest challenges that people have with trust after abuse is they often feel, um, well, that you're profoundly different. You've had an experience and, and honestly, it's not necessarily, it's not a bad thing. I was gonna say, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. When you're, after you go through abuse and you realize, oh my gosh, you know what? Everybody in the world is not like me. They don't have the same morals or the same motivations. They can be profoundly painful. You are just, you're wiser. And so the old us is probably was probably going around immediately trusting people, taking them at face value, and was way over trusting and naive and didn't realize it. And I would say that's that is the vast majority of people out there until, you know, until something happens where they kind of have to take a step back. So uh, realizing, okay, you know. Um, the way that you're going to be after abuse is it's about defining, not only defining a new normal, but defining a new and empowering normal. And so trust is one of those, it's one of the, those places people really get stuck on. Uh, Cause like I was saying, they, they think, okay, I'll be healed when I go back to the way that I was. And then they feel profoundly broken the rest of their life because they cannot go back to the way they were because life because life never works like that. Life is always about moving forward. It's never about going backwards, but they don't realize that. And it took me a long time to realize that too. So, but like I said, it doesn't have to be a bad thing because taking people at face value, moving really quickly, um, you know, immediately just trusting people, that's generally not a good idea. Like it's, it's not a healthy, like trust is something that's earned. It's not something that's freely given. And it's something that's earned with appropriate behavior over a prolonged period of time. And you're seeing that person in a, in a variety of situations. This is something that I've added to that little spiel of mine, because what I've seen from a lot of people is they're like, well, but you know what? I've known this person for six years and um, you know, but then like, then I'll later find out, oh, but they've never met that person's friends. They've never met their family. They, maybe they just had a sexual relationship. So it was only them on and off for six years. They didn't have context. So when I talk about trust is something that's built with appropriate behavior over a prolonged period of time, it's also what you're doing in that time. If you're only spending time in bed, you know, that's only going to show you so much. Like you, you really need to kind of get out there. How are they interacting with the world at large as well as you? So um, I think in uh, Brene Brown, I think it was in her book, Daring Greatly. She gives this great analogy about trust. And she was saying, uh, it was her daughter, I forget, I don't know, third grade or something. And the, the teacher had a jar, like a big you know, one of those jars you put flour or something in, pretty big jar. And um, every time the class was good, she would drop a marble into the jar. And then the whole thing was, okay, well, once that jar was full, then they'd have a pizza party. 
So they'd cash in the marbles, right? If the class was really acting up, she would take a marble out. And so Brene Brown said, she's like, you know, that's such a perfect analogy for actually building trust because that's what it is. It's one marble at a time. And somebody breaks trust, you take a marble out. But I think it's even more than just one marble out. And of course, sometimes things are so egregious. Somebody breaks trust in such a big way that you just have to dump the whole jar out and, and walk away. But it's given one marble, one marble at a time. And once that trust, and you know, here's the thing too, like I forget which, we just recently read this book and I still, I can't for the life of me figure out which one this comes from, but um, they were talking about kind of the foundations necessary needed for a healthy relationship. And they had said uh, emotional empathy was one. Empathy, I think emotional uh, intelligence and emotional what was it? Emotional intelligence and emotional, um, uh, I guess, emotional intimacy with that other person. So being able to express yourself with your different emotions. And then that, what we were talking about earlier with the different types of intimacy, you know, how are you with, you know, emotional intimacy, just physical intimacy, touching, snuggling, kissing, hugging, these kinds of things. Uh, financial intimacy, um, you know, just sexual intimacy, like all of these different types of intimacy, kind of where assessing continually, I think, continually assessing this dynamic in these different categories to kind of see what needs work. Uh, let's see here. And I think too, also realizing as far as trust and everything goes, that you set the pace. This is something that so many survivors fear because they got so profoundly hurt the last time around because they unknowingly let somebody else set the pace. So realizing that you set the pace, if something starts feeling uncomfortable, if it's too much, if it's just too much too soon, whatever, it's okay. You can say, Hey, you know what? I think we need to back up a little bit or, um, I'm just, and I'm not comfortable with this. So you'll know you'll know kind of where you are if you're able to connect your emotions to your environment and kind of what's going on. So like a lot, and that's also another big part of healing is realizing that we don't just tend to feel a certain way for no reason. Um, more often than not, especially feelings of uneasiness, a lot of times that tends to stem from there's been some sort of boundary that's been pushed or crossed or flat out violated. And then generally the degree of the emotion that we're experiencing is the degree of the violation. So taking some steps to get that, you know, back into alignment and figure out, okay, well, this is, maybe this is stressing me out because it's, I don't know, um, certain things about it that are just, it's too much too soon or what have you, then, okay, would you feel better if you know, the situation were to be altered a little bit to where it wasn't, you know, putting yourself out there so much. Uh, and that's a good point, Allison, who says, I want to learn how to trust myself and my internal compass and my feelings first before someone else. Yeah. And that takes, you know, it takes time and it takes practice. And I will tell you, I think it's it's always going to be a challenge when our heart and head don't line up. When, you know, you meet a person, you have some sort of opportunity, whatever, and you just don't have inner peace about it. There's always going to be that struggle there. I think that's something else that's important for people to realize. So it's, it's not that that ever goes away. That cognitive dissonance is something that 
is something that we all experience on a relatively regular basis. Again, it's the degree and frequency that is more of the issue. So let's say you meet somebody online and you're like, oh man, this person's so amazing. And, but you just, um, things, you know, very quickly, things aren't adding up. It can be very easy to think, um, oh, the reason I'm having trust issues is because of my previous abuse. When really it might just be the situation at hand. And the only way to really tell is, well, I think it, it really helps to be super familiar with different forms of manipulation and abuse, because then that way you have the vocabulary for it and you can label it and be like, yes, this is triangulation. This is projection. This is ghosting. This is silent treatment. This is, you know, love bombing. This is what have you. Uh, that really, really, really helps to get rid of a lot of that cognitive dissonance. But um, sometimes it's, it's still there and it's something that you have to just kind of work through, but realizing if that's there, then this is sign to just, you know, to back up and go slow or to, to just go. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Marina says, can I, or should I be the bigger person and let how badly and purposely they hurt me go? Or do I accept I am now a family of me and my dog and one sister I half trust? Well, I don't, I don't think that's a necessarily like a valid, um, I think there's more options there besides just those two. So, and why, let's just let's just back up and start with the first one. Should you be the bigger person and uh, uh, let how badly and purposely they hurt you? Let it just let it go. Um, if it was easy, if it was that, if it was like, oh, I'm just going to make a decision to just let it go. I think we would have all done that. And so it's, I guess, right there. That's kind of a, like a almost like a false dilemma because it's that's not really an option to just kind of let it go. I think when a lot of people say, oh, I'm just going to let it go. What they really mean is I'm just going to, I'm just going to really try to work hard at suppressing my anger and, and not feeling it. I don't want to be bothered with it. I just need to quote unquote, let it go. Healing from this isn't about letting go of anything. It's about moving through those feelings. So the anger that the anger and hurt you have, it's righteous a completely appropriate way to feel when you've been violated. So that's going to be this process. Like we were talking about earlier, you know, Pete Walker. And again, we'll talk about this tomorrow night in the book club. He has this process for it, which I think is just, it's so succinct and it's just so well stated of, um, you know, the verbal ventilation, the healthy angering, the, uh, um, what is the third one? The healthy, the verbal ventilating and the healthy anger, the grieving, and then the um, kind of allowing yourself to just feel your feelings. So, uh, and it's a process and it's something that we tend to go round and round and round and round and round. We just, it's like the, the, the stages of grief, if you're familiar with those. Um, I forget why they're like seven, you know, like anger, denial, bargaining, acceptance. Uh, and we don't go through them in order and we don't go through them just once. You, you just, this, this is just how we all process these kinds of emotions. So it's this continual kind of going, just going through, um, going through that cycle. And over time, those feelings become less intense and uh, uh, just so much more manageable. So when they are surfacing, he, I think, it, yeah, it was Pete Walker in his book, The Tao of Fully Feeling. He talked about it he, as the analogy of, um, you know, kind of being out in the ocean. And at first these, I think it was him, uh, these feelings can be so intense. They're just big, huge, like waves that when they hit you, it's terrifying. It feels like it's just going to sink you and push you under. And then over time it becomes, those waves become more manageable. 
And then there does come a time where you can see the waves coming and then it, it, you can surf them to shore. So I guess that's what I have to say about um, the, the hurt. I, I don't think there's any other alternative other than to, to move through it. And that just takes time. Uh, but okay, so, or should you accept that you are now a family of you and your dog and your one sister that you have trust? Well, I think at a minimum, uh, if the reality is that you are a family of you and your dog, uh, it's, I think that's worth accepting if that's the reality, but also keep in mind family, uh, it doesn't have to just be people that we share blood with. I think I fully believe that you can just choose, you choose, <laughs> like you can add to your family at any given time. So, um, I mean, I know I do. I'm not terribly close to a lot of my family, the vast majority. So I, you know, I've got a good friend of mine. Um, both of her parents died when she was fairly young. And so it's just been her, she's not close to her brother. And so it's sort of like, okay, right, and there's quite a few of us that are just really not terribly close to family or don't have family. It's like, we've become family. And so I think, you know, you, you're an adult, like you can decide who's going to be family. Family, to me, family are those that are there. They're there when you need them. They're supportive. They're reliable. Um, you know, that's what family is. Okay, let me scroll down. Uh, And that's a very valid point, Kevin. He says, uh, I have no problem with getting angry. It's just what to do with it is the problem. And, it, and I think that's the, the, um, the challenge for so many people is sort of like, okay, if I tap into this anger, that's like turning on a fire hose. And I don't know if I can control the ways that it comes out. And I don't know if I can turn it off again. And you know, and that can be very overwhelming. Um, I would encourage you to think about um, kind of planning for ways to release that anger, thinking of it as in terms of like a, like a, a lid or uh, yeah, like a lid on a pot of boiling water, you know, to slowly kind of just letting that steam out instead of just taking the lid off all at once or instead of just turning on the fire hose or letting the fire hose be turned on. Thinking of ways, planning for ways to, to allow that the venting to happen. So um, for example, uh, I don't know, you could go to a shooting range. You could go take some kickboxing classes or boxing classes. You could go for a run. Um, you could turn on some really intense music and get a punching bag and just get it out and just, you know, scream and yell and cuss and just get it out. There's, uh, I was just saying the new thing around here is hatchet throwing, uh, just things like that where you're, you're being physical and you're getting that energy out because that, that energy, there is so much energy and anger and trying to just keep it inside and, um, put on a happy face and g go about your day. It's, it just doesn't work for very long. Like that stuff, it just starts seeping out of every single pore. So uh, allowing yourself time to, to get it out of your system can, it really does help. Uh, Jennifer says, does Pete Walker talk about how to become angry? Because I've never gotten angry. I think he does. I think he does. Um, in the book, the, the Tao of, fully feeling. I'll have to go back and go back and check. I know one of the things that I'm a big fan of with that, what I have found that helps is thinking about something that evokes that emotion within you. So maybe that's um, uh, music, like, 
you know, uh, really intense emotional music, like, I don't know, heavy metal or rap or something that just really gets you going. It could be a movie that you watch that really evokes a, that strong emotion of anger within you. Um, so same thing with crying for sadness. I think that might be an easier, well, I don't know, it depends on the person, somewhat easier emotion to tap into with movies at least. You know, watching, I don't know, I'm a big fan of the movie Beaches, an old movie. Cry and cry and cry. Uh, if there's, um, I'm trying to think of other shows out there that ideally that are not relationship related, you know, if that's going to be a trigger for a person. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I'd have to think about it, but move, you know, movies that evoke that emotion of, of sadness can be good and just allowing yourself to cry. Do you become, Jennifer was saying, I can, she said, I can cry, but becoming angry is really difficult. Are there certain things that tend to get you angry? So for example, I feel the exact same way. I really struggle with like tapping into anger when I feel it. But what does get me angry is if somebody else is being wronged or violated. That brings out the mama bear in me like no other. Um, I watched a documentary. I forget, I forget the name of it now. It was not too long ago about, uh, uh, rape on college campuses. And I was, out, I was outraged <laughs> and it took all I had to keep my cool. As I was watching it, I was just like, oh, hell no. Like something has got to be done. This is horrible. The way people are being treated. So that that works for me, tapping into it that way. And then just kind of riding that wave. Crystal Jean is saying, she says, oh my God, Dana, I just bought Beaches. Have you seen it yet? It's such, I, it's such a great movie. Yeah, Jennifer, you have so much insight. <laughs> Do you know that? I just want you to know that. Um, but you just never cease to amaze me. She says, I make up excuses. Like my father is a sick person that needs help. So I can't get angry. Yep, that makes complete sense. It's hard. I think especially when the person who's violated you is a parent it's really difficult for children at any age to, um, to fully acknowledge that how hurtful a parent has been to them because of what that means, you know? So it's sort of like if I actually, and, and I think, again, I think it was Pete Walker, I could be wrong. So maybe it was Pia Melody, one of the two talking about, uh, one of the shifts in healing is for survivors of abuse, especially childhood abuse, again, childhood, you know, under the age of 18, like child. So it could be, you know, you were saying your situation, Jennifer, started when you were 12. That's still, you know, that's still young. Um, when this, and I would say, frankly, now that I'm saying it out loud, I would even say it's the same with adults. Abu I just think abuse at any age, when a person internalizes it, I think that's the key the key there, not the age. It's what they're doing with it. If they're internalizing it, instead of, instead of seeing, uh, they take this on in, in terms of shame of seeing themselves as bad and flawed and, and, um, uh, and then a big shift in healing down the road comes from a placing appropriate blame but here's the thing with this. This is, this is 
the concept, I mean, boy, I think if there's any concept out there that truly isn't talked about, it's appropriate blame. All of these concepts are avoided like the plague, but that one is especially people are really uncomfortable with it. Um, and for the longest time I was too. So I, you know, <laughs> I, yeah, it's, it's tragic. I think when you realize, um, that we uh, as a society are uncomfortable with that. We're uncomfortable with, you know, we, we kind of want to hold on to these platitudes. Oh, hurt people hurt people. And they did the best they could. And, um, you know, these kinds of things, it helps to, to um, because people aren't comfortable with anger is really what it boils down to. We're, even though we're not necessarily, like even though compact, quote unquote, compassion like that can feel invalidating, that's still oftentimes more comfortable than allowing ourselves to get angry because then it seems like, well, if, if I'm blaming somebody, then that blame is always wrong, isn't it? Like that means that I'm not being accountable for anything because, you know, okay, actually now that I'm saying it out loud, it's because there really isn't, I guess the only other word would be like responsible. Maybe that's what it is talking about blame, it feels like um, something, you know, it feels wrong, right? Like it feels like, oh, that's an immature thing to do or an irresponsible thing to do. Um, only people that can't own up to things blame others. Like blame is never given a positive connotation. I guess that's what it is. Holding people responsible for their behavior. I like that. I like that better. I'm going with that. Um, is something that we're not taught because I think people are just uncomfortable with it. They don't know what to do with it, but that's, and again, I, I wish, I don't remember who it was Pia or if it was Pete, but one of the two was talking about, that's a big stage in healing of assigning a, a quote unquote appropriate blame. Now this doesn't mean that we're going to say, Oh, you know what, mom, you did this to me. And, um, uh, I don't know, you were horribly abusive for, for all of my life. And, and now this is why, this is why I never uh, graduated high school. This is why I got pregnant young. This is why I keep getting tangled up with all these abusive people. This is why, like there's kernels of appropriate blame in there. And then there's just this added blame. So when people talk about you know, you're not responsible for, for being abused, but then you are responsible for the healing. That's kind of separating that out and being like, you know what, mom, your actions, the appropriate blame is you hurt me. You abused me. That was not okay. And that was a hundred percent your fault. I was a child, you know? So like you were the parent and that was on you. I didn't deserve it because no child does. Uh, the adult is the one that needs to be the adult and be like, you know what? I'm frustrated. I'm angry. I don't know how to parent. I need help. They need to be the one to go out and handle these things, not blame the child. Well, you, I hit you or I did this because you were acting up because you were naughty because you were difficult because of that. No, like it doesn't, that doesn't fly. Um, but so, okay, anyways, so you've got that appropriate blame, but then realizing, okay, yeah, this is the, I'm assigning appropriate blame. This is what this person did to me. It's not right. It's not fair. It shouldn't have happened. I was victimized. This is just incredibly painful. Then once you assign that blame, you can, then you can start working through those feelings of anger, of, um, you know, all of it. And it doesn't mean that you're somehow giving yourself um, a pass for all of, uh, you know, that you're blaming them for anything other than that. And it doesn't mean that you're even blaming yourself for anything other than that. Does that make sense? Jennifer says, yeah, it's so hard to take responsibility for healing when it wasn't my fault being a child, even though he quote unquote gave me the choice to say no. Here's the, the most 
I think something that pretty much any survivor of childhood sexual abuse struggles with is the level of grooming and the level of manipulation because abusers, this is what they tend to do. They tend to form quote unquote relationships with these children, with children like this. And so in the child's mind, and this is why children don't come forward. It's why they feel guilty and ashamed and like they're betraying the person when they do. And there's all this mix of feelings of, you know what? I led this person on. I could have, I could have said something, but I didn't. Maybe even certain things felt good because you're a child. But it's the dynamic. It's so twisted. It's, it was never um, a relationship of, of equals. So even though that person, this is, this is, you know, this is why it's called grooming. It's just a little bit at a time. It's making this person feel, um, you know, you're, that you're in this relationship with this other person, but that's not what it is. It, it's, it, is not what it is because it's never a relationship of equals. There's such a huge power difference there and and a maturity difference. A child, even at 12, even at 17, if you've got somebody that's significantly older and more experienced and they're just kind of working all these different angles, the child doesn't stand a chance. Like if, I mean, really, like, of course, they're going to fall into that web when he, especially, you know, if you have an adult that's, really just showering them with all of this attention and affection and they're making them feel, you know, important and, um, you know, all of this stuff, this, this is, this is how this happens. So everything that you're feeling is totally normal, um, for somebody who's gone through what you went through, but, you know, um, And Jennifer was saying, you know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't punish me for saying no. But when I did say no a couple of times, he'd lock himself in the room and sob. I hated putting him through that. I felt so guilty. So at the time, I didn't want him to feel that way. It felt easier to give in. Okay, but Jennifer, that is him punishing you. So even though it might not have been physical punishment, it was definitely emotional blackmail. Wouldn't you say? That's sort of, it would be sort of like me saying, uh, oh, you know, you want to, you want to go out with your, fr it's like, I'm your mom. Okay. Oh, you want to go out with your friends tonight? Oh, well, okay. I guess that's, I guess that's fine. I'll, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. I, you know, um, I'm just, I'm just going to stay home and I'm just going to cry. And, um, but I, I want, I really want you to have a good time. And I'm laying all this guilt on you and, you know, or saying like, you can go to college. That's probably a better example. You can go to college out of state. I'll, I'll be, I'll be fine. Um, and then, you know, then you hear me sobbing and I'm open around the house and I'm saying things like, oh, I'm just going to miss you so much. And I just, um, you know, I don't know how I'll, I'll, get through this, but I somehow will. Well, that's still being punishing all of that guilt. It's passive aggressive and it's pushing the person into doing what you want them to do, which is to me, it's worse than physical, the physical stuff, because the physical stuff, when somebody's actually being punishing, when they, you know, they push you or what have you, it's easier for a person to link up that that's a punishment versus something that's emotional like that. It's so much more difficult to pinpoint. So no, it was Jennifer at, it was all manipulation. Well, and Jennifer was saying it's hard to know if he emotionally blackmailed me or if he was in legitimate pain from him knowing how scummy he is. Well, and you know what? I don't even know if it, frankly, if it really matters. My guess is that it was a lot more 
um, intentional, um, then you realize because when he's, when you, I think if anything, he was well aware that uh, crying and being like, oh, I'm a terrible person and blah, blah, and then you giving in. Um, I think if anything, that helped him get rid of the guilt and helped him convince himself in a twisted way that, uh, that he wasn't a predator. So it's hard to, you know, it's hard to say kind of what his level of awareness was, but it just, um, I don't, you know, not that you would, not that I would even recommend that you watch this, but, uh, the movie Finding Neverland with two of the children, the now adult children that had come forward talking about Michael Jackson being abused, sexually abused by Michael Jackson. Uh, a lot of what you're saying is exactly what they cover in that documentary, uh, which to me is why their story was so believable because this kind of stuff, I mean, unless they were really coached, um, this kind of, I mean, the, the, the intricate em emotional parts of it, the, there was a, they talked about this one uh, time, one of the little boys talked about how Michael Jackson, um, he woke up in the middle of the night and Michael Jackson was crying in the corner of the room. And he was saying, you know, how much he loved him and he was going to miss him and all of his stuff. And, the, and these little boys, you know, they're, I don't know, six, seven, eight years old, were feeling responsible for making Michael okay as a human being, they just felt emotionally responsible for him. And so did the kid's parents. The kid's parents were like, we just thought we saw him as another one of our children. And they just, they had all of this desire to, to take care of him. Just, uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Dev says it's leaving Neverland. Yeah, I think finding Neverland is the Peter Pan movie. Thank you, leaving Neverland. Yeah, Jennifer says, I think it's very believable, and so does my therapist. It's hard to see all these Michael Jackson defenders' comments online. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. <clears throat> there were so many things. I mean, just so many, so many details that they could back up that I just don't see how that could be anything other than a sexual, a child sexual predator. Um, so, you know, he had uh, given, I think both of the boys jewelry they had done, he, at least with one of the, the little boys had done like a quote unquote marriage ceremony uh, where they exchanged rings. Uh, the same little boy, he'd bought him a fax machine and the parents would say, they had pictures of it. Like he was, you know, faxing letter, handwritten letters to this little boy, you know, dozens of letters, it was just all of this attention and affection that he was showering on him. And, uh, and to, and the boys, the way that they were talking about it, they were saying, and they didn't come forward for the longest time and they were defending Michael for the longest time. A lot of it was those, those that struggle with those emotions of, you know, were we abused? I don't really know because we were willing participants in this and I thought I loved him and I thought he loved me. And there was this uh, kind of in their minds, like, uh, like a relationship there. But of course, you know, as an adult, like you see this and you're like, no, this is not a relationship. Here's it's a, it's a grown man exploiting little kids. And I can see how he made them think that, that this was a relationship and you know like you can see it a lot more clearly when you're an adult but i i can also see why the kids and their parents felt the way that they did so Okay, let's scroll here.
Um, people are talking about OJ Simpson now. Yeah, people think he was OJ was innocent. You know, you that OJ was found guilty of murder in the what it was at the civil trial. I don't think a lot of people know that. Just um, FYI. <clears throat> Okay, let's scroll. Let's just change the topic here. Chat's kind of getting a little heated. <laughs> Kevin says, didn't OJ write a book if I did it? Yeah, he did. Uh, which is really disturbing. Uh, let's see. Okay, so... The chat, I'm so sorry. The chat is going off on a tangent. Let's switch topics here. Um, okay, thank you. <laughs> Eyes wide shut. Thank you. I appreciate that. It uh, says, Dana, your book, Out of the Fog, is pretty good, better than I expected. I am going through it a second time. Thank you, that's that's really good to hear. Um, yeah, lots of lessons learned in writing. I, you know, I just recently finished book number three and uh, <laughs> uh, so many lessons learned with all of these. The, I think one of the most difficult things with with writing books on this topic is it's really difficult. There's so many concepts that are so important, but it's very difficult to write about them, to kind of explore the certain ones in a more comprehensive way without being redundant. And um, so that was, I don't know, that's, that's kind of uh, been a challenge, but Uh, Frankendahl says, do you have any tips to help with brain fog? A lot of the brain fog uh, tends to come from stress and, and it tends to come from fight or flight. So when a person is having a lot of stress in their life and they're in that fight or flight mode, what happens is that the, the neocortex, like your prefrontal cortex, your logic and critical thinking part of your brain goes offline. This is why we become so reactive um, when we get angry because the, the logic and critical thinking part is not there. So we're all, it's completely emotion reactivity based, which is a problem. Uh, and it's also one of the reasons when we experience something traumatic, we are not thinking clearly. This is one of the reasons, you know, they, they say don't make any major life decisions for a year after a significant life event, a death, a divorce, these kinds of things, because we don't realize that we're not thinking clearly. And unfortunately, and then we're also being driven by our vulnerabilities more often than not. So that's where it gets, can be really dangerous because we think we're thinking clearly, but because our we're trying to meet our needs, um, but really we're making terrible 
decisions and don't even realize it. So what can help with the brain fog is focusing on trying to be in the present moment. So getting out of that fight or flight and restoring your kind of your internal equilibrium, I guess you could say. Uh, some different ways to do that are through um, guided meditation, a lot of mind body awareness type things. So uh, like in the different, what times, the different meditations that we do, which we'll do here in about 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, if you notice, I have started incorporating kind of different um, techniques to try to anchor people in the present moment. So focusing on the temperature of the room, focusing on the feeling of the fabric of your clothes, or if you're lying in bed, like your, your sheets or your blanket, um, um, focusing on your breathing, listening to sound. So using your different senses that can bring a person back into the moment. And it might seem kind of, uh, I don't know. I didn't give a lot of this mind body stuff, the weight that it really deserved until fairly recently, until I took this trauma class, which was just fantastic. And really uh, truly understanding that when a person is traumatized, there's just your whole, everything in your brain is just working differently. And one of the most important things to do is to reestablish that sense of safety um, as much as possible. So oftentimes that includes having a routine. Um, it includes feeling as safe as you possibly can physically for whatever that might, that might mean. Um, feeling safe emotionally. So uh, being very conscious of who you're sharing kind of delicate information with and how they're responding to it. So you wanna make sure, for example, if you're talking about uh, experiences with abuse that you're talking to people that understand and that they're sympathetic and empathetic and, and supportive, not people that are telling you to get over it or to, um, you know, that you should be happy or, you know what I mean? Like that kind of stuff, or that it's your fault. Like that's not helpful. And that's just going to send you right back into fight or flight. So I think goal number one is to, to get out of fight or flight and to restore that internal homeostasis. Um, and that's done in a series of ways throughout the day. So different grounding exercises, like I was saying, do, using the five senses, let's say you're at work, um, you can, in your finding yourself feeling triggered or just really flustered even, um, uh, part of it, you know, going to the bathroom, washing your hands, just feeling the water on your skin, uh, feeling the soap, lathering, uh, just, you know, feeling skin on skin, just being fully present in that moment, um, these kinds of things, feeling your feet on the floor. If you're again, walking, I don't know, you're walking somewhere, noticing how your each single foot feels when it's touching down. Is it, you know, is it heel first and then the middle of your foot and then your toe or how are you walking? Really noticing every footstep that you're taking. Um, other things with brain fog is you know, I think a lot of it is just realizing that your brain is not functioning the way that it normally does. Here's the thing, you know, there's, it's so, we're, <laughs> we, we so don't give these bodily changes, the, um, the credit or the seriousness that they deserve. Sort of like if a woman's pregnant, right? You're going to have physical changes. There's going to be physical changes to your body, and there's also going to be brain changes. You know, it's really common women get baby brain and they can't think straight. They're tired all the time. They're emotional. Um, they're experiencing depression. There's hormonal changes that are going on. And then there's also, uh, you know, the brain fog is a very real thing for a lot of people after a baby. So I would just view it like that. Like it's, it's not a you thing. It's like an experience thing. And so your body is just trying to get back, back to normal. So during this time after abuse, if you're really struggling with brain fog, 
just like if you had baby brain, like, okay, you know what? <laughs> like, this is not the time for me to be doing my taxes. <laughs> like somebody else needs to step in because I don't want to get audited, right? Um, but you realize I need to, I need to get some of this stuff off of my plate because this isn't working. It's just causing me to be frustrated and I don't even think I'm doing this right anyhow. So being compassionate with yourself and just realizing right now your brain's just, it's trying to find normal again and that's okay. And to not fight it, just it's, this stuff is all hardwired and it, you know, it's deep in your brain circuitry and it's just going to take a little while to, to sort it all out, but trying to, uh, make yourself as safe as safe and secure as you possibly can during this time is it goes, it's huge, huge. That's a good point too. Fairy magic is saying, yeah, changing your diet changes your brain as well. Yes. Yes. Yep. Feeding, feeding, your body and your brain nourishing things. And this <clears throat> kind of what you're feeding your brain also really helps. So like, you know, body wise, um, you know, I think taking a multivitamin during this time of stress depletes the body of so much. And so that can really help. Uh, you know, um, at least I'm a big fan of take, especially taking vitamins when you're sick or when you're under a lot of stress, um, uh, you know, eating, trying to eat as balanced foods as you can, nourishing foods as you can with your brain, paying attention to what you're feeding your brain. If you're, if you've got CNN on like my father, 24 hours a day, that's incredibly stressful when it's just news, everything that's going wrong in the world. It's, you know, if <laughs> it's amazing because my dad, he's, he just, you know, it's just background noise. Like he likes it. He likes just having it on. I don't, I don't, um, I don't really watch the news. I'll kind of, because it stresses me out. I just hear it from other people <laughs> and I'm okay with that. But, uh, you know, if I do watch the news, it's, I search out specific stories and I might read them and then that's it. I don't, you know, bombard my brain with that. So being very mindful of what you're feeding your brain. If you're watching a lot of anxiety inducing things, again, remember, this is going to send you right back to fight or flight. So this is, this is the time to be watching comedies, documentaries that are about, you know, non-triggering things. Um, um, just these kinds of things. So unrelated calming things. <laughs> Rob says, oh, Dana, my mom, she's the same. I assertively hand her some headphones when she's doing that, LOL. Yeah, Jennifer says, oh my God, Dana, my grandparents on my mom's side, uh, Blair, CNN and Fox News all day. Yes, this is my father. It's so funny, my father, in many ways is a lot like, um, if you remember the show Seinfeld, um, George, his parents, that's my father and my stepmother. <laughs> so like, yeah, I go to visit, and, like, just, oh my God, it's too much, it's too much. Uh, yeah, this, it reminds me of that one, um, <laughs> That one episode of Seinfeld where George's dad is trying to <laughs> he's trying to embrace relaxation. Do you guys remember this episode? And his therapist or somebody told him, "Oh, you just you know serenity now, serenity now." But he's he can't. He's so like amped up all the time that he can't even do that. And so he just starts screaming, "Serenity now!" Like, yeah, that's that's it. <laughs> uh, Oh, that was a funny episode. Uh, you know, and that's another really great point, Allison. 
mentioned that she got off social media because she couldn't stop comparing her low points to everyone else's high points. And it really helped her to, to, to stop by stepping back. Yes. And you know, I think this is something that so many of us get sucked into is, uh, is doing that. And it can be really difficult not to, even though we know, I think most of us understand that social media, it's not only is it another person's highlight reel, it's also a highly edited version of their highlight reel. So, and it's so easy for our brain to fill in the gaps and to create this whole narrative about this amazing life that they're off living while here we are, you know, slogging through the day with the job. And, you know, you've got, I don't know, teenagers that hate you and you've got, you know, all those taxes and bills and, you know, things, life. And it's, it's, it can really make a person feel uh, shorted, you know? So yeah, it can help to, to get off social media and not compare. Yeah, changing my life says, and that's the reason I got off Facebook. It was bringing me to a low point. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, any more, at least how I use Facebook is I go there. I really am only there to participate in the groups that I'm in. I, you know, I run two, basically two groups there on Facebook. And then I have like, I don't know, a ridiculous amount of other groups that I'm in. Like I have writers groups that I'm involved in and, and these kinds of things. So that uh, is enjoyable, but I don't, I don't even look at, cause you know, it, it annoys, it bothers me when people I, that I know are posting pictures, they're posting pictures of stuff um, where I'm like, it's just I, the, the level of denial or deception is just ridiculous. And it just annoys me. It's even worse if I'm there with them and they're posting all these pictures and making it the trip or whatever seem like it's a certain way and it's totally not. Like, I don't like that. That just is weird. Uh, let's see here. Ah, <laughs> that's a good way to put that, Bonnie. She says that my narcissistic family on Facebook unfriended me recently. I love it. I consider it a self-cleaning oven <laughs> when the narcissists unfriend me like that, LOL. That's funny. Yeah, Jennifer, I'm, I'm with you. She says, I know this might sound bad, but part of the many reasons I don't want kids is because I honestly don't think I can handle them. I'm healing myself from my childhood at the age of almost 34 now. My clock is almost up, but I don't regret it because I never wanted children for many reasons. I'm glad my boyfriend is on the same page. I felt the exact same way, and I don't think that sounds bad at all. Frankly, I think that sounds like a very mature decision and a very um, considerate decision, you know? I, like I said, I, I can totally relate. I uh, was one of the reasons I asked for a divorce from uh, or wanted a divorce from my ex-husband was we were at the point in our marriage where he was, he wanted to have children and I just wasn't there. I had so much stuff to work through in my own life and I had to get situated and get traction in my own life. And I was totally overwhelmed by that. And then I kind of realized, you know what, I think it's going to take me a while to work through all of this. And then it was this feelings of guilt of, well, I don't want to like eat up all this time for him. You know, if he can go out and find somebody else, you know, it just, it was, it's awful. It's awful when you kind of realize that, you know, I don't want to just have a child to, um, have a child. I, I want to be ready to have a child. So yeah, I can relate. And then later on, I got pregnant for the first and only time. Um, I forget I was, 
um, like mid, I don't remember, 35, maybe 35, 36. But then I ended up miscarrying, but I was terrified. <laughs> I was terrified to be pregnant. And I, uh, I remember thinking like, this is, you would think I, I, I felt like a, I felt so unprepared and terrified. I felt like I was 15 and pregnant and I was 35. So it was, I get it. And I absolutely love kids and, um, you know, I don't know, maybe one of these days I'll, I could see, I could see myself fostering, but yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's hard. <laughs> Dev says I have two kids. Anyone want them? Uh, Yeah. And Salon says, you know, becoming a parent is a big responsibility. It's mature and wise to think about it. That's okay. That's a good um, question. Marina, who asks, when is threatening and trying to control others narcissist behavior? And when is it narcissistic flea behavior? It is really difficult, I think, to differentiate that. Um, and I think we'll talk about this a little bit more in book club tomorrow, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, last Thursday of every month. Uh, but narcissism, I think kind of the core of narcissism is mainly entitlement. So whereas the, uh, you know, narcissistic like flea behavior isn't, entitlement that tends to stem from uh, more of like a person being uh, uh, reactive, I guess you could say, or um, kind of fear, maybe possibly fear. It depends and it depends on what the person's being threatening and controlling about. It could be fears of abandonment are activated. It could be, uh, you know, kind of unhealed wound stuff that's being activated. But at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. So if you have somebody in your life, and this is another, I think, big turning point in healing for a lot of people is, um, is it, it doesn't, it really, and this, and this is going to sound wild, but it really doesn't matter what's going on with the other person. If it's, if they're codependent, if they have fleas, if they are bipolar, if they are, you know, um, a narcissist, if they have Alzheimer's, it doesn't matter if they're causing you harm, if they're trying to, if they're setting fire to your house, right. That's because that's basically what we're talking about. Like if this uh, problematic behavior, it doesn't matter what's going on with them. The only, the only reason why we even think that that matters is because it's sort of like <clears throat> how, what kind of emotional response we would have to it. So I think if you think about it in terms of it's more about what's acceptable and allowable for you um, and then having that boundary. Does that make sense? Uh, Bonnie was saying, yeah, control, power, entitlement. That's the toxic triad of a narcissist. Okay. Marina was saying, yeah, that thanks. That does make sense. And the reality is, you know, if we're talking, uh, it, it, cause I, I know a lot of people get hung up on that and they don't, they might not like when I say that saying, okay, well, it doesn't matter if the person's Alzheimer's or if they have you know, bipolar or they're a narcissist or they had a bad day, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, if they're doing something that's hurtful to you, that's the hurt, the hurtful part of that is what matters, not what's going on with them. I think a lot of people are like, well, but it does matter because I need to know they get hung up on um, the kind of like how, where their boundaries should be. 
Like, oh, and th- but this, I will tell you, if anybody's out there thinking that, this is a sign that some boundaries need some work. And it's just a, it's just some adjusting. So if it's the thought of, well, but if they have Alzheimer's, let's, we'll use the, the analogy, they're setting the house on fire, okay? Literally. Oh, but if they have Alzheimer's, well, they can't help it. This is their brain and I'm going to have, you know, compassion for them or, or what have you. And, and same thing with the person that has bipolar disorder, you know, they're, um, this is a chemical thing and, you know, what have you. I think if you just look at it as when people are doing stuff like this, it has nothing to do with you. It's always about something that's going on with them, whether it's a neurological thing like Alzheimer's, it's a chemical thing with bipolar, it's a personality thing with narcissists. Even though you're on the receiving end of it, that's so such extreme outrageous behavior, but it doesn't have anything to do with you. They would be doing this to somebody else if it if you know, it just kind of we happen to be there. And so we were on the receiving end of it, but this is how that's going to just keep going. So. You know, Rob, I don't know. I've kind of wondered the same. He says, has anybody seen Missouri Cowboy these last few months? Any news? I've seen him over on Angie's channel. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know if something happened over here, if he's mad at me, or I don't know, I don't know. I've seen him around, Um, but yeah, I don't know what's going on. I didn't wanna put him on the spot and ask him because I just kind of thought, well, if something happened and uh, yeah. Well, and that could be it too. Marina says, well, maybe it's a day of the week thing. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I would be curious to know. But I, I, like I said, I didn't want to put him on the spot. So. Yeah, Allison says, a big turning point in my healing was when I just stopped mid-explanation of why someone was hurting me to the person who did. It stopped mattering whether or not they knew what they did. Yeah, it's, it. there's so much power in that. I, I struggled with that too for um, like the longest time. I had a, I think what, the, one of the realizations for me is I had a, like a quote unquote, well, friend of me, <laughs> just a friend of me at work who we hung out, we hung out and we, I thought we were on decent terms for years. And then the switch flipped in her when she found out I was writing a book. And then she began making my life a living hell at work. And I was going back and forth. I'm like, okay, well, you know, she, is it, what is this? Is this like, you know, triggered codependent behavior? Is she a narcissist? Is she a psychopath? Because what the hell? Like, I was really trying to figure it out. And then I just realized, I'm like, you know what? It doesn't matter. Like what matters is I am not going to tolerate being treated with like this, with disdain, contempt, and hostility. Like I'm, will not have this in my life. And that realization was such a huge gift because it allowed, it freed me to just walk away instead of trying to stay in it and figure it out my being assertive with her didn't work, uh, being ingratiating with her didn't work. Uh, all of these different tactics that I was trying to bring peace back into my life weren't working. And then it was just like, this is just not, it's not workable. So yeah, Bonnie says, that's what narcissists are. They're frenemies. Yeah, they really are. You're... And Julie says, you know, I think the key to the beginning of her own of her own healing was that it's not your fault. I still need to hear that sometimes, but it made a huge difference to me. Yeah. Yeah, there was I think there was a scene in the movie Goodwill Hunting, if I remember correctly where Robin Williams was playing 
Matt Damon's therapist. And Matt was talking about some stuff that had gone on in his childhood. And if I remember correctly, Robin Williams grabs him and just hugs him. And he just keeps saying over and over again, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. And then finally, after, you know, the 10th time of him saying that, like Matt Damon just starts breaking down and just crying. And it's so, it's, you're so right about that with just truly understanding it is not your fault. It is, it truly is not your fault. A person, they can, um, you know, they can, they can be angry. They can be upset. They can have a bad childhood. They can have all of these different things going on with them, but that doesn't excuse or somehow justify them being abusive to you in any way, shape or form. It doesn't. So it's not your fault. Nobody asks to be abused. Nobody uh, deserves uh, to be abused. Nobody uh, there's not something that's uh, like profoundly flawed or broken about you or that, uh, you know, that you're somehow like deserving of, of this. Like it, it's, it's not, it's not that like, there's no excuse for abuse and nobody deserves it. And it's not your fault. You couldn't have most, I mean, especially if you're a child and even as an adult, like you couldn't have, stopped it. Like there's no magic words that a person can say to change an abuser, to fix an abuser, to earn their dignity or respect, to get them to stop abusing. Cause it's not about you. It's not your fault. You didn't start it and you can't stop it. The only way we can get out of it is to get distance. So it's, this is how they are and this is how they will continue to go through life. So You know, Jennifer, that is a great question. And um, I am going to write that down. Let's talk about that tomorrow. And um, we'll mention that in the book club. Okay. How to get over shame in order to have if you don't mind can you be a little bit is the shame specific i guess what is the shame relating to um And Julie says, so while Jennifer, while you're answering that, Julie says, sometimes abusers want you to think you are to blame. That's a lie. They tell you to keep you under their control. Yes. And that just speaks to their mindset because that is the abuser's mindset. If they can justify it to themselves, then it's okay. Right. You got home late. That's why I yelled at you. You failed your test. That's why I broke your windshield. You bought new lipstick. Um, I'm not okay with that. So that's why I dumped bleach on all of your clothes. Like this is this is the thinking, right? Because in their mind, you did this. If you hadn't have done that, then they wouldn't have done what they did. But what they're missing there is they can be upset. Anybody can you you have every right to be upset and angry and to feel how you feel. It's okay for you to feel how you feel. However, it's not okay for anybody to act however they want to act. So you can, you know, abusive parents are the same way. Like, oh, well, my child, um, you know, stayed out until 4 a.m. and I was absolutely livid. And then uh, they lock the child in a closet or something like that. Like, oh, okay. Like you can be upset and angry. You can't lock your kids in a closet. That's not okay. Uh, you know, you can't beat your child with a belt. 
not okay. You can't, do, you know, do, like there's a line there. Like you can feel how you can feel, but that's the thing too, though, with uh, abusers, because it's not always that that somebody else did something wrong. They they forgot something or they did something wrong. It's whenever a person acts in a way that the abuser is not okay with. You know, oh, you didn't study, you didn't major, you didn't want to take over the family business. You didn't want to major in what I wanted you to major in. You don't dress the way that I want you to dress. You don't, you don't read my mind. I didn't want to have Chinese food for dinner. I wanted to have pizza. And then they get upset. It's, you, it's, it's, they're in their own reality. Like, you know. Yes, I am bright blue. <laughs> Says uh, Dana, are you planning to publish more videos in the future, not just live streams? Yes, I've been meaning to for the longest time. And I so apologize. I know that these live streams are just really long and, <clears throat> you know, that it's too much. And, and I know for most people, I totally understand that. At a minimum, what I'm going to start doing here in the near future is splicing up. Um, I'm probably going to start with Angie and I's live streams. Um, uh, Angie and mine, me and Angie. <laughs> the live streams I do with Angie, how about that? The live streams I do with Angie, I'm going to start splitting up into shorter ones. And that should happen within the next couple of weeks. So I'll release, be releasing those as questions. So those will be shorter, like, you know, five, 10 minute videos. And then um, start doing scripted ones. Yeah, the live streams. Yeah, Bonnie, thank you. Bonnie says, I love the live streams. Yeah, live streams are great. You know, you're got a, I guess, a long commute or you're cleaning the house or, um, you know, people tell me all the time, they're like, oh, I, I listen to them. Uh, I fall asleep to them, which I'm not quite sure how to take that. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, hey, they're going, to, they're going to good use. These, these live streams, I, the original intention with them was seriously to basically, it was, I was getting so many emails from people that I couldn't, I still can't get back to everybody. And so I was like, you know what? Hey, here's the deal. I'll be here for three hours every Wednesday night. You've got a question, something, he, he, I'll be here. And so um, I really thought these live streams would be more for the, just the people in the chat. I really didn't think that anybody else would ever want to come back and watch them. So. Uh, <laughs> very much <coughs> very magic says i fall yeah i fall asleep to these live streams too yeah <laughs> ah, that's funny oh well thank you allison she says i just wanted to say i recommend these live streams to people i know and abuse or healing from it i'm 21 as are most of the people i know it's helping us relearn earlier on what we should expect. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for doing that. And uh, yes, I, I think it's so important because these conversations aren't had and it really does help to prepare people, especially you know, in your early twenties, this stuff is, it just can be absolutely life-changing, absolutely life-changing. So I'm, I'm excited for you that you're discovering boundaries and standards and deal breakers and getting in tune with your emotions and realizing kind of what's nourishing for you and what's toxic for you. It just, it changes who you date. It changes, um, different types of jobs you have, it's just everything. So yay. Yay you. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jack says, hey, Dana, have you thought about editing the end of the live streams to make videos of just the meditation portions? I think some of us have trouble doing it at this time. Yes, 
uh, I am working with Paul on making some videos that are meditation that are like specifically geared to meditation ones. So we're, I think the goal is for us to start putting a playlist together here in the near future and on different topics like inner child, anxiety, um, relaxation, different topics like that, self-esteem. So people can just go there and then, you know, click, <laughs> click and listen. So, okay, you know, speaking of which, uh, we are due for our meditation. So if you guys want to take some time and settle in, this is the part in these weekly Wednesday live streams where we do, um, we do, we do these guided meditations. So if you are able, take some time to get comfortable, find a, either a seated spot or a place laying down where you can just settle in and taking some time to just be here in this present moment. Taking a series of breaths in through your nose And exhaling deeply out through your mouth. Turning your attention inward to your heartbeat. Feeling it beating inside of your chest. That slow rhythmic beating of your heart. Continuing to breathe. Realizing that you are here in this moment and that in this moment, there is no future, there is no past, there is only now. Realizing that it's okay if you're struggling with any depression or anxiety or any other uncomfortable feelings, it's okay to set them down during this time, that you can pick them up afterwards when we're done, if you would like. But for our time together right now, it's truly all about right now. Feeling the heaviness of your body as you begin to relax with each breath in and out. Bringing your attention to the top of your forehead, slowly making your way down, relaxing all the major muscle groups along the way. Relaxing your forehead, your eyebrows, your eyes, your cheeks and your jaw. Allowing your jaw to fall open and your tongue to fall from the roof of your mouth. Relaxing your neck, your shoulders, Allowing your shoulders to roll backwards. Allowing your chest to fully open. Relax 
relaxing your shoulders, your arms, your wrists, your hands and your fingers. Allowing your arms to fall in whatever position is the most comfortable. Relaxing your stomach <clears throat> and your torso. Unclenching any of those muscles. Just allowing your chest and your stomach to fully relax. Feeling the heaviness of your torso as you do so. Relaxing your hips. <clears throat> your lower back. Your thighs, your knees. Your calves. Your ankles your feet and your toes. Unclenching your feet and your toes and just letting them grow heavy as you continue to relax. I'm bringing your attention back to your breath. And as you breathe, allowing those breaths to travel deeper down into your lungs and your stomach. Down into your hips, and your thighs, down all the way to the very tips of your toes. Letting each breath, allowing each breath to let your body rise and fall. easily and effortlessly. And if you notice your thoughts drifting back to the future, back to the past, just gently remind yourself to be here now. There's plenty of time to get lost in the future or lost in the past. But for right now, it's okay to just be here. It's enjoyable to just be here in the now. in the stillness of this moment as it unfolds second by second. Allowing yourself to reconnect with your body, realizing that there is so much that is good and right about this moment and that there is so much that is good and right about you. There truly, truly is. Acknowledging to yourself the different things that are good and right about you. Your various strengths that you have. Perhaps you're caring, compassionate, a good sense of humor, inquisitive, fun loving. You have a laugh that comes easy. you're dedicated to personal growth, that you are strong, that you are wise, that you are capable, that
that you are powerful beyond belief, that you're dedicated to self-care, so many things that are right about you. And it's okay and it's important to acknowledge the various strengths that you have and to realize, you know, that you really do bring a lot to the table just the way you are right now, today. There's a lot that is good and right about you. So let's just take some time right now to acknowledge that and to visualize giving yourself a really big hug and just affirming that this is not, what happened to you is not your fault. It is not your fault. It is not your fault. There is so much that is good and right about you and you did not deserve this and it is not your fault. When you're ready, come on back and open your eyes. So thank you guys so much for joining me. Remember, we have book club tomorrow night at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to be discussing the book, Complex PTSD, From Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. It's one of my all-time favorites. I think it's fantastic and should make for an interesting discussion. So um, hope to see you then. So have a wonderful rest of your night. Okay, take care. Lots of love to you. You are not alone. You are not crazy and you really can move forward and heal from this. So take care. Good night. Bye.